Hey, how you doing? Flipped Geometry class. This is Mr. Alley. We're moving on into lesson 1.3. We're talking today about the fundamental uh, ways of knowing in geometry. We had some undefined terms and then some defined terms last time, and now we're getting into really what geometry's bread and butter is, um, and that is postulates and theorems. So uh, we're going to dive into it today. The title of the lesson is An Ideal Geometry. Um, and that comes from Euclid's terminology, but basically we're talking about the logic of geometry and how geometry works and how you put it together, okay? So the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, the definition of this way of knowing. Geometry is an orderly, systematic body of mathematical knowledge, and you can apply the geometric logic to other forms of, of mathematics, not just to shapes and figures. Um, but geometry is really about how to think. Uh, and it's more about logical uh, progression and reasoning than it is even about physical objects, okay? So we have a progression here. We talked about some undefined terms and several definitions last time that we were together, and we're moving on today to talk about postulates and theorems. So um, this, is, this is the stair-stepping or the leveling up of the, uh, the sorts of knowledge and, and factual statements that geometry can make. So we've had undefined and defined terms already. This is going to be your first exposure to a postulate. Um, postulates are sometimes also called axioms. You might hear the word axiom in other scientific classes that you take, um, but in our textbook they're called postulates. And a postulate is a basic relationship that is assumed to be true without a proof. Um, and these are usually things that are self-evidently true. It only takes a few seconds of thinking about for you to say, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and these are postulates or axioms. You don't have to prove a postulate. You can't really prove a postulate. It's something that just shows up as true, and you have to just say, okay, and move along, right? Um, most of them are obviously true, and they form the basis for theorems. So we build theorems based on postulates, okay? So what is a theorem? Well, a theorem then is a statement that you have to prove, a statement that needs to be demonstrated to be true. It's not something that can be immediately um, reasoned with in your brain and go, oh yeah, 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 that's true. A theorem, you're like, really? Let, let me see why. And you need to prove that a theorem is true, and you do that by using postulates, okay? The proofs of a theorem can use definitions, postulates, and previously proved theorems, so theorems can build on one another. Mathematicians look for three characteristics in a set of postulates. Um, its basic assumptions should be consistent, independent, and complete. And by that we mean that they all agree with each other. Uh, the assumptions of a postulate need to be consistent. One can't assume something that another one disproves or does not assume. Um, they need to be independent. They, they need to stand on their own two feet. And they need to be complete. They need to com you know, do the whole job of, of demonstrating that this postulate uh, is true, or this group of postulates is true for a theorem. Alrighty. So a postulate system is consistent if its postulates do not contradict one another. I kind of just said that. It's independent if no postulate can be deduced or proved from the other one, and they, uh, they are um, all necessary if you're going to have all these postulates to prove theorems, okay? And remember, you're not having to write every word of this down, right? Okay, there you go. We're moving on. Um, and a system of postulates is complete if it forms a sufficient base for a full description. So the postulates do the whole job of proving the theorem. So don't worry so much about, oh dear, do I know all of the, all of the key ideas of what is a postulate and a theorem. You're going to use them so much in this class that you will be incredibly familiar with postulates and theorems. Alrighty. So let's talk about a postulate that you will use all the time. This is like the most important one out there. It's called the expansion postulate, and it helps you understand the difference between a point, a line, and a plane based on the number of locations that's required to describe it. So a line contains at least two points. Of course, a point is itself, right? So if you have one location, you can define a point. If you have two locations, you can define a line because the line can connect those two points, okay? And a plane consists of at least three non-collinear points. So if I have three points, I can't draw a line between those three because the line is a straight object, but I can 
find some surface that I can set these points on that touches all three points, and then I've defined a plane. Okay, so one location is a point, two locations, two points is a line, three locations that do not line up is a plane. Okay, and then a fourth one, space, contains four points. So if I have four non coplanar points, I can't draw a line between them and I can't put a plane on all four of them. I have to say, in order to describe all four of these points, I need space, I need volume. I need to talk about um, a three-dimensional reality, okay? So one point is a point, two points is a line, three points is a plane, four points is space. Um, now we're going to look at each of these separately. So a line is determined by two points. So they're just going to demonstrate each of these to you, right? A and B determine line K. Because I have two points, I can connect them with a straight line. So any two points can determine a line, okay? Um, the line postulate also um, can go backwards and say that any two points in space lie on exactly one line. So if I have two points in space, there's only one line that will connect them. So I can use two points to define a line, and I can only define one line. Uh, you can't draw multiple lines with the same two points in space, okay? Um, a plane postulate, it contains three points to, um, to, to describe a plane, or a plane needs three points to be described, um, and they only lie on one plane. You can't take three points and pass multiple planes through those three points. Only one plane will pass through those three points. And then the, um, the plane postulate can also be done with, instead of just with three points, but with a line and a point, right? And you still have three points, right? You still have three points, but you've drawn a line through two of them and said this one is not on the line, okay? So if two points lie on a plane, then the line containing those two points lies on the same plane. So you can say that these three points define the plane, and then I can connect two of those points with a line, and that line is in the plane because the points that defined it were in the plane. Okay, if that doesn't make sense, look at that picture a couple times and I think your brain will go, oh yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, the intersection postulate, if two lines intersect, their intersection is only one point. We already talked about this with concurrent lines, that two lines that intersect can only intersect in one place. In order to have two lines intersect in two places, you'd have to have at least one of the lines be curvy and lines aren't curvy, lines are straight. In order for it to be curvy, it has to be a curve, not a line. So two straight lines can only intersect in one place, okay? Uh, the plane intersection postulate, if two planes intersect, then their intersection is exactly one line, and you saw this already in 1.2, where you had to say, what kind of object is there where two planes intersect? And we've already looked at that, and the answer is a line. Two planes intersect, in one line, not in multiple lines, only in one line, okay? No, the, not the last one, but another one. Um, the first theorem that we're gonna get to here is that a line and a point not on that line are contained in only one plane. So if you have three points in space, you define a plane. If you have a line and you pick some point in space next to it, you can only draw one plane that passes through the line and that point. If I take the point away, I can have an infinite, um, an infinite number of planes that pass around that line. But if I pick a point, then a plane has to go through that point and then through the line. And there's only one plane that'll do that. Okay. Another theorem is that two intersecting lines are contained in only one plane. So if I have this line and this line and they intersect I can only pass one plane through that so that both lines lie in the plane, okay? So an infinite number of planes can go through this line because it can go all the way around. But as soon as I define another dimension to it, there's only one plane that'll go through that area, okay? So two intersecting lines lie in only one plane. Another theorem, two parallel lines are contained in one and only one plane. So I have this line and I have this line, and those two lines are parallel, and I can pass one plane through both of those lines, 
only one plane. I can't pass multiple planes through that set of parallel lines. And that's also the definition of parallel lines, right? Are two lines that lie in the same plane. And so therefore there's only one plane that the two parallel lines can sit in. Okay? That's it. There's a lot of ideas in there, but I think that uh, you're, you can grasp these concepts fairly quickly, and we will play with them a lot tomorrow. So, God bless you, Jesus loves you, and so do I. Good night.